What so. direction are you headed? More records with Sub Pop? Yeah, well, we signed a contract for three records. We've got two more. But we could always change our name and go to a major. We could just alter our name, you know, just put another and in our name, Nirvana. 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 Dear Dave Agus Fulcher Arresh, this is Jerome at home in the loft and today Sweet young teenage, sweet no more We're looking at Sub Pop, the independent record label that harnessed the flourishing punk revival movement in Seattle, Washington at the end of the 1980s and took the world by storm with it at the beginning of the 1990s. Now the origins of the label began with a fanzine called Subterranean Pop, created all the way back in 1980 by Bruce Pavitt, which alternated publishing written issues with compilations of tracks from underground rock bands on cassette tape. By 1983, Pavitt was writing a sub-pop column in Seattle music magazine The Rocket, and in July 1986, the sub-pop record label pressed a compilation on vinyl for the first time, the Sub Pop 100, including music from future legendary producer Steve Albini and soon-to-be genre icon Sonic Youth, who would have a significant influence on music history. The driving force behind the emergence of sub-pop, however, was the charismatic Jonathan Poneman, who remains at the helm of the label today. Although the bands themselves have always preferred to call their music punk, it was Poneman who was responsible for coining the term grunge to describe the movement as a subgenre. In 1987, with a 50% stake in the label agreed with Pavit, Poneman approached the band that he had already identified as a leading light in the Seattle scene and told them they would be the future of rock music. That band was Soundgarden, and Poneman was so convinced of their brilliance, he immediately put up $20,000 of his own money to record and distribute their debut single, Hunted Down. It became a landmark record which put both the band and the label on the map. So much so that the success of Soundgarden's single and subsequent EP would become far too much for the label to cope with. By 1990, the band had long left Sub Pop, was signed to A&M Records, and ultimately destined to sell over 30 million records records worldwide. Yet, following closely on the heels of Soundgarden was a band that would go on to be an even greater phenomenon. Nirvana's debut single, Love Buzz Big Cheese, launched the Sub Pop Singles Club, a subscription service where the label would post a limited edition 7-inch single from a new or emerging band each month at a price of $35 for the year. In 1988, a pressing of Love Buzz Big Cheese would therefore set you back just under $3. In 2024, the estimated value of that single is now $6,000 and rising. Sub Pop would release further Nirvana singles and a debut album the following summer, but like Soundgarden before them, the band would become far too successful for the label to cope with. At the urging of Thurston Moore of Sonic Youth, Nirvana decided to ditch the label and sign with the David Geffen Company instead, ultimately going on to sell over 75 million records worldwide. Now there's a treasure trove of other notable alumni and music to consider of course, but first I need to bring in our guest this evening. Joining us live from the idyllic settings of Taranga on the Bay of Plenty, New Zealand, is the connoisseurial conquistador of record collectors and my comrade of choice on the mean streets and leafy suburbs of early 1990s South London, Mr. Jeremy Glass. Dear Gwitch, Jeremy. Order. So Jeremy and I are each going to pick our five favourite Sub Pop classics within the following criteria. Firstly, they must be Sub Pop releases. No tracks recorded by bands before or after they were signed to the label. And secondly, we're only considering the first five years of the label. Specifically, from the release of the first Sub Pop single, the aforementioned Hunted Down by Soundgarden in July 1987, to that of the Codeine single Realise in July 1992. So we'll launch into number five. What have you picked for us, Jeremy? I've chosen a band called Come. This is their first release. I've got my original 12 inch here. The song that resonates the most is a track called Car, which is the lead single. But Come were a band that formed off of the ashes of Live Skull. And the main singer songwriter is a lady called Talia Zedek, and she's still going now, still recording artists now. Uh, the track is about six minutes long, and it's a bit like if Hole were nuanced in terms of their songwriting, it's kind of like that. So she sings in the very much a Courtney Love 
howl, although a little bit reduced, but there's a lot of blues in there. I was a big fan of their Matador albums that came out shortly afterwards, but the track car still sounds great. And I think actually the cherry on top is a chap called Chris Brockroar, who was in the band. He was a guitarist. And his play out, the two minute, two and a half minutes of guitar at the end is amazing playing. And in fact, it was a close call between choosing this Come 12 Inch or choosing one from his other band, Codeine. I mean, Codeine's albums, Frigid Stars and uh, and another one, are well, I like highly thought of. And so it was, it was a tight call between those. But I went with the Come track mainly because I'm a sucker for long songs. And so, so six, six and a half minutes of that, you know. And I'm mindful that, that um, I, my first two selections are kind of dodgy names, you know. So in my first appearance on YouTube, I'm talking about a band called Come. But there you go. Blues Noir is a term, isn't it? Shadows and light, musical chiaroscuro. Yeah, it's got like that Sonic Youth influence as well. We were talking earlier about Sonic Youth and how influential they were on the entire alternative underground rock scene. And it's got that kind of nice Sonic Youth thing where they build something up and then they take whatever, all the layers away. Um, but I think also the undercurrent for Come, and I would really recommend people check out their albums because they are the kind of albums that really grow. So they're kind of the kind of band that you listen to once and you think, oh, yeah. Yeah, that's okay but then when you come revisit them they really do pay back your listenings and i think that even now i put on one of their albums and i would sit through it you know given that you know when we listen to sub pop back in the 90s your taste in music evolves but i still really rate their albums as that the musicianship all the way through is amazing so there you have it jeremy's number five is a seven minute epic car by come now my number five is from the screaming trees and it's changes come from the changes come ep now you're already a fan of the band before I'd even heard of them and I remember you quite actively trying to get me into them coming over armed with copies of Uncle Anastasia and Sweet Oblivion. Now you've said about only getting into things after repeated listening. Screaming Tree sort of falls into that cardiacs category where I didn't get them at all on initial listen. How did you first come across them? I think actually that in that way I think I bought Change Has Come because the excitement around Sub Pop, once you sort of bought some of the Sub Pop records you kind of started going alright if this band is good on this label then maybe all of the bands will be good and I think at that at that age when you were what was I then 19, 20 you kind of went to the record shop it wasn't like now we had Spotify and you could listen to a band and, and judge whether you liked it before you did it you kind of pretty much went by the name you know you mm. kind of went through the racks and went oh that looks amazing so there's so many albums you bought but just on the strength of the cover and the band name alone but yeah. with Sub Pop, you, you, there was a comfort in buying stuff off the label because the label was so good at the sort of hiring really good bands. So if you like one thing, you're going to like the other. So it came across Screaming Trees. I always thought their name was dreadful. I mean, Screaming well, Trees, what's that? I mean, there, there were some English bands with some great names. Remember Terminal Cheesecake? But Screaming Trees, it just has all the promise of like some proggy hippie nonsense but the guy's <laughs> voice you know mark lanagan mark lanagan i mean the songs were written by the the, the guitarists um i can't can't think of his name and gary lee connor that's it yeah lanagan would write the words but lanagan has got an amazing rock voice so they were a great band to listen to because you had this you know wonderful singer which always is the cherry on top and then after the sub pop ep they signed like a lot of bands from seattle did uh, to to a major i think sweet oblivion is the one which i think everybody kind of got into the one yeah, without, you know, I believe really lost you. And then they kind of petered out a bit. They were one of the bands that didn't quite go on to great heights. But then it was always obvious that he was going to be a bit of a solo trader. And obviously not a guy that played well with others necessarily. So yeah, yeah. they were always going to be of their time. But, well, but I, 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 I think Unusual Voices put people with mainstream tastes off a bit. And Mark Lanigan does have that wonderful baritone that sounds a bit like the hardened leather sole of a cowboy boot. You yeah. know, um, it, it's not as extreme as Stuart Staples from Tinder sticks but i married somebody who can't tolerate eddie vedder's voice and um you know and i, I didn't really notice it as being that remarkable before but do i know? do think most people's tastes are kind of tuned towards particular generic styles of singing i mean most english people don't consciously realize that they actually revert to an american accent when they sing and do find um, people that sing in english accents a bit jarring yeah i kind of agree but then when you think of the great english punk bands a lot of them are great 
great because there is an Englishness about them. Yeah. You know, they, did, yeah. they didn't bother with the American accents. Even you mentioned Cardiacs earlier, you know, uh, the singer Tim Smith is very English in his delivery. And then, of course, famously, you got the Rolling Stones, probably. I think of Mick Jagger as sort of, you know, putting on an American blues thing. So well, that's I kind of that. there's anything wrong with doing that at all. Just that music needs diversity in its genes. And I do really appreciate that kind of old American, very deep blues grass flavour that underpins Mark Lanigan's voice. I think his solo stuff emphasises that kind of blues grass flavour. A bit more, bit more folky, but it does come from, like you say, a very deep place. And it sort of matches with Screaming Trees, that kind of psychedelic Led Zeppelin 1970s, but not quiet thing. But you knew if you picked up a Screaming Trees record, you would find two or three tracks on there that you would really like. And so Changes Come is a great one. It's actually, I think, the only thing they released on Sub Pop as well. And it has the iconic look of Sub Pop records, the band at the top with Sub Pop and then a bit of Charles Peterson photography. I love the way a lot of their releases were really great photography of the band on stage yes. that you're about to be playing. You know, like in motion sort of thing. You had people sort of either crashed on the stage or wrecking their guitar or something. And it felt like the photography included that live feeling. The bands that you and I would see wouldn't play stadiums. They would mm. be in those small venues and you could feel the heat and the sweat and, and the gasoline coming off the stage. Great cover art, great EP. Mark Lanigan and the Screaming Trees are my choice at number five. So Jeremy, what do you have for us for your pick at number four? Okay, so second is a seven inch by a band called Lubricated Goat. So a lot of people watching this will think, holy moly, is a band called Lubricated Goat. So John Peel, Radio 1 DJ, was a famous champion of a lot of this music. And one night he played 20th Century Rake, which is the B-side of that seven inch. And it's great with John Peel play something because often the stuff he played sounded like nothing else you've ever heard before in your life. And certainly this song has a sort of Captain Beefheart influence. There's a Beefheartian growl to lead singer Stu Spasm's vocals. The other thing it has is a real mind f***ery going on with this sort of weird loop and delay on the guitar. So all the way through the song, these chords are building and repeating in the background. So it's quite intense, a bit like listening to The Fall, you know, like where it has this sort of momentum. And I was listening to it the other day, trying to work out what the hell they were singing about in it. Because like a punky thing and you're just kind of liking the sound of it. But well, hang on a minute, what actually are they singing about? So my favourite line is some saucy strumpet mackerel whittle board. I thought that was just worth mentioning. Opiated gay deceiver, trollop suckling baggage seducer. I know, exactly. You know, who knows? Sub pop but... singles tended to have great B sides because I had that single too and I remember that A side. Meeting yeah. my head. Meet my buddy, meet my head, just sort of repeated over and over. It's a psychedelic mixed seamlessly with the punk. I mean, he's, he's called Stu Spasm. And of course, the famous iconic sub pop 7 inch. I mean, when you were young, just by having them all look similar, you just kind of wanted to collect them. Well, as you mentioned, you've opted for Lubricated Goat with 20th Century Rake at number four. I've gone for Babes in Toyland with House. And this particular single will always remind me of a bizarre event. You and I had been to the Camden Palace, a music venue near Mornington Crescent Underground Station. Before our time, of course, it was called The Music Machine, where many of the biggest punk and new wave bands used to play. And it still is a music venue today, now called The Coco. But back then it was the Camden Palace. And uh, this night was wasn't a gig it was no. it was one of their weekday club nights called feet first yeah. they kicked out around two i think and we got a cab back into the suburb with some randoms anyway at some point between three and four a.m i wake up with an awareness that someone had got into bed with me right i leap up ready to kill in the dark like a shell shot war veteran couldn't we allow ourselves just this one moment of indiscretion no turn on the light it's one of the randoms from the cab ride she had somehow crept into my house burglar style in order Order to take this really insane gamble as far as out of the blue romantic overtures go. It's all for you! I mean, just ask me out, make a pass at me at a party or in the club, you know, that's not insane, that's not alarming. And then we're scratching our heads for days trying to work out how the hell she got in. It turned out in the end it was It, it wasn't was an really easy infiltration, was it? Because I think you had to be like Spider-Man to get up to this gap and then you had to it snuck in, so she was pretty determined. And this window was like nearly six foot from the ground. I mean, I mean it was the weirdest thing. Anyway, the consensus was that she was incredibly agile and skinny and bonkers. Don't call me crazy! This song will re always remind me of that and the kind of madness that motivated that. You know, if, if we heard the story from her point of view, it might have been the lyrics that... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a great song and one of their very, very early ones. It was like another cameo performance of a band that were out on other labels at the time. When you, we were talking before we did this thing about our top fives and I saw yours, I'd be honest, I completely overlooked this track entirely. So when it turned up on your top five, I was a bit sort of gutted because it is an amazing track. Other than the fact that Cat Yellen had probably one of the best female howls. I mean, she was like a banshee, but there's a bit in the song where it slows down. So the song's trucking along and it kind of stops starts but when it goes into the slower riff there's a bit it, of genius in there she kind of almost goes even further down you I know? think it has an underlying sophistication to it though you know yes it has that fierce punky energy but it, it has a Americana infused in its sound it has a sort of twangy Dwayne Eddy guitar sound to it that's sort of evocative of highway motels and highway diners you know that sort of thing it, it, it sort of transports you to their world you know like a, a movie soundtrack I think it's as good a track as anything they ever did and of course they were terrific live. Everyone knows about Cap Yelland, of course, but the drummer Laurie Barbero was a superstar too. Aside from the Reading Festival, which is never a, a great place to see any band, they were the very first band that I saw at Rock City in Nottingham when I first moved up there. A venue I'm really, really fond of. One of the many times I saw the Levelers was there, but I also saw Mud Honey, Rage Against the Machine, Faith No More, PJ Harvey and Sonic Youth. It's quite a small, intimate place which lends itself to brilliant, brilliant gear. So, Babies in Toyland with House, they're my number four. Jeremy, your number three is another one of those superior B-sides so common to sub-pop single releases. That Hunted Down single I mentioned at the beginning. So this actually is the Screaming Life EP that came on sub-pop, but it contains the track that's my pick, which is Nothing To Say. We were talking about it earlier, but Soundgarden was probably the reason that sub-pop started the label in a weird kind of way, you know, because they were the band that they everyone thought was going to be the next big thing. I think you can certainly see why by listening to the song and I think the thing that stands out Chris Cornell the lead singer I think originally started as the drummer I don't think he was going to be the singer and then That's which right. is quite surprising it's yeah. Amazing. yeah if anyone watching isn't aware of Chris Cornell I ought to say that he was one of the supreme voices of rock music and nothing to say very much showcases that voice it's a very powerful track in a weird way the manner in which nothing to say provides a vehicle for the rare vocal talent of Chris Cornell reminds me of the early Stevie Wonder single I don't know why. And That's it's, brilliant. It's an amazing song. That brain just sort of makes a connection between the two. The way that both songs have a repeated refrain that invites ad-libbing and improvisation within the limits of the voice. Yeah, I mean, it's got like a lot of Soundgarden traits in there with Kim Tiles, the sonic building of the track first. But when they first go into the sort of big Sabbath type riff and then Cornell starts singing and the height and the power of his vocals is so far above the music that yeah. it does give it a sort of like epic quality which was what they did and in later years I think he got a much more sort of like soulful delivery uh, for them but I think their best stuff for me is, is the early stuff because I think there was something sort of not quite metal not quite punk about them that, that kind of actually is what, what I liked rock about them. Uh, even more so after leaving Sub Pop but I think they're actually quite atypically rock for Sub Pop but I agree with you about their earlier stuff I mean Bad Motor Finger their first album on a major label that's the one I keep coming back to I mean I know they were exponentially more successful later but I think that was their peak wasn't it they did all the, all the stuff that they synthesized from their early years into their first... I agree with that but I know their super fans would insist otherwise and say their smash hit stuff super unknown There's, and so on the performance of them playing Rusty Cage on Jules Holland later many years later they came on that show mm. and they absolutely that that song that the live performance of that song is amazing you know the bit at the end where they again slow it down that's classic sound garden this big sort of Sabbath riffs and a lot of muscle but I I saw them live a few times and they were fantastic live. I saw them in the marquee one time around, I think it was after the Loud Love, is it the Loud Love? But you're right though, there was a little bit of heavy metal about them. They were kind of always destined to be Love Eye fans of Guns N' Roses, just as much yeah. as somebody, you know, yeah, other yeah. thing. I think, yeah, yeah. Nothing to say is Jeremy's choice at number three. So I'll see your sub pop beside Jeremy and I'll raise you another. The Afghan Wigs with White Trash Party. It was the opener on their debut album, but only the B side to a non album track which well I'm not even sure I can remember how I am the sticks goes but uh, White Trash Party is an immediate winner. I think the wigs for me I mean that track again that was one that immediately came to mind because it was the one when I used to sort of do the tapes it was always the one I put first off because it just is a real punch to the jaw isn't it straight away when it comes in it's got that sort of wah wah thing Greg Dooley is like in full blown screen mode and it it is sub pop on steroids you know I do love Afghan wigs so I feel that they're better stuff 
stuff came on later after our little you know we are up to 92 yeah. I think Gentleman came out just after then and Gentleman for me is the one if you were going to say listen to an album by Afghan Wigs it would be in Gentleman again another really good live band and, and a charismatic front man in Greg Dooley I remember seeing them a few times live and he was notorious for picking hecklers out of the crowd and threatening them for a fight you know sort of thing he, he wasn't to be messed with so they were quite a formidable uh, touring bunch and I saw them live no, I, I do hear what you're saying about Gentleman it's a very accomplished album but I prefer up in it every time the immediacy and rawness of it the, the punk aesthetic Jack and Dino producing of course I mean to take a far more extreme example I prefer the studenty punk garage incarnation of Lemonheads that you find on Lick in complete contrast to the corny dreary indie pop mediocrities that raked in the big bucks on It's a Shame About Ray it's an overindulgence thing when people spend too much time on something recordings tampered with too much on the desk songwriting laboured over too much I do find some of the songs on Gentlemen a bit too overthought uh, it's interesting you say this because you and I were very big fans of the sub pop punky sort of stuff but a lot of the other folk like twee indie things like Lemonheads so Lemonheads really appealed to you know like a lot of our friends and they listen to this stuff and it was quite easy on the ear and think you know most people's grandmother would, wouldn't mind listening to it where you and I liked the more out there babes in Toyland you know stuff that was a little bit mine I remember the countless times where you and I would be trying to put our music on at a party and it would probably get about two songs in but by being removed because White Trash Party in particular would be turn that up and it, it would peel the wallpapers off from 20 yards you know and, With you and though, I think there's a far more receptive ear to this kind of music nowadays generally speaking kids have a far more eclectic range of tastes than we used to I agree, in the yeah. 70s and 80s music involved tribes and there was a yeah, yeah. culture of gatekeeping about what people should and shouldn't listen to if you were a ska punk new wave kid you definitely didn't want to get caught dead listening to someone like U2 or Luther Vandross or something it would have to be a very secret and very guilty pleasure you and I were both definitely guilty of some terrible musical snobbery oh, yeah. you know like uh, absolutely well, do you think we were worse than the Americans with that I mean we know there was a sniffiness on the Seattle scene about selling out or becoming too commercial sounding and as I said at the start they didn't like being categorized under the term grunge they called themselves punk bands although here in England we'd feel a bit silly calling Nirvana punk certainly compared to Mud Honey who have a more consistently punk sound I actually think the Melvins and Nirvana's first album you can see the influence of the Melvins on like Big Cheese and things like well, that well Del Grover played drums on some of that first album wasn't he their second drummer before Chad Channing he, he certainly played with them but, mm. but you know Melvins had that there was no real guitar solos in there it was just sludgy riffs and some shouting over the top when you, you say know, like sludge it, this is probably where we get the word where the word grunge, grunge comes from yeah. Yeah. anyway before we go off piece from the fiver again let's just confirm that Afghan wigs with white trash party are my number three choice do tell us what you have as your runner up we talked about him earlier so Mark Lanigan this is a track called Ugly Sunday which is off of his first solo album which is called The Winding Sheet that's a lovely song certainly the best one on the album I think yeah the, as the album gets on it sort of the quality goes but you know as soon as he released that album you can see him becoming an artist in his own right you know because the style of it is pared down we're removing the screaming tree sort of zeppelinisms and that sort of stuff you have this guy with this incredibly gritty singing voice and it's timeless you can play that now and, and people would go oh, what's this and it's got that kind of timeless quality on it I was just thinking actually as, as we were talking about Chris Cornell and Mark Lanigan are no longer with us which is quite mm. it's sad really when you think you grow up it's a bit like the thing when you get older and some of your heroes when you were young and the people you really liked are, are no longer with us but he went on to quite a successful solo career later on where he released other albums and he started to do sort of even more sort of electronic stuff but this album and Whiskey for the Holy Ghost and also I would say Gaps at Midnight which is the third those first three albums are all amazing and they get sort of progressively better you can hear that his influence is Leonard Cohen Tom Waits kind of oh, previous yeah. gloomy singer songwriters of your it does go to show the confidence the label had in themselves by 1990 you know becoming a little bit more eclectic and yeah. go for a bit of diversity let someone from a band release a solo project and release some slower gentler material I think they probably just heard it and went well that's really good and he probably just delivered the tape and went listen to this they probably went great mate well, when can we release it you know Jeremy's runner up choice is Ugly Sunday from the Winding Sheet album by Mark Lanigan now my number two is About a Girl by Nirvana from their debut album Bleach released about seven months after their debut single there's a lot of tracks on that album that I like particularly Big Cheese but About a Girl really flies off that album as something quite different it's a very very poppy track and certainly an indication of where Nirvana 
we're destined to go. I mean, you might summarise Kurt Cobain as this fascinating conflict between punk on one side and pop on the other. I remember when I first saw them on British television, they were due to do Smells Like Teen Spirit on the Jonathan Ross show. I think Nevermind had just come out. And when they came on, they did Territorial Pissings instead and smashed up their amps. Jonathan Ross was annoyed, but actually it was great. There was a lot of safe music at the time, and you know, bands like Nirvana suddenly coming onto mainstream TV was inviting people that didn't really give a monkey's about that sort of world. And they, and Nirvana, and a lot of the other bands that came on would often sort of sabotage their performances with all sorts of. I think I remember them on top of the box playing "Smells Like Teen Spirit," and he delivered the vocal delivery like he was Andrew Eldritch from Sisters of Mercy. You know, like he kind of sang in this sort of almost like gothic growl. They, they were always pranking around. I think with Nirvana for me, there's something devilishly simple about their music that belies a really, really rich... I mean, obviously, Kurt Cobain was a great songwriter. I don't think anyone could have just sat down and written about a girl, but it sounds really simple. It's got a very simple... Well, it's instantly accessible. It has that sort of sing-along quality that entices people that wouldn't otherwise like their style of music. And it's very, very simple musically. I mean, anyone who's never picked up a guitar before could almost instantly be taught to play that E minor to G chord verse. The solo does doesn't meander or challenge the underlying chords, but it's the lyrics I think are quite powerful actually. Really, really evocative. You've got this really vivid set of circumstances and characterizations that's got a lot of emotive pathos invested in it. It's quite a conspicuous piece of songwriting to be sat in that early sub pop canon. You can see that Cobain was someone who was destined to operate at a completely different level from everyone else there. A genuinely elite class. I mean, talent. he, I mean, Kurt Cobain was a troubled, I mean, he obviously was a troubled individual, but he used to do amazing mixtapes and stuff. He was a bit of a connoisseur when it came to, you know, his own taste in music. And he was a big fan of a band called The Vaselines. And you can hear him being influenced by some of the kind of melodic music that he liked, because he liked a lot of really bizarre stuff. But I think there was a, a kind of almost a classical songwriter in there. It's a shame, really, when you think about Cobain, Cornell, Lanigan, that they're no longer with us. But with Cobain in particular, you do feel like you're a bit robbed of later gems that would have come out. He would have carried on being a fantastic I, I think songwriter well, I, think. I think but again this is conflict between someone wanting to be simultaneously poppy and punky and sub pop they recorded with Jack and Dino a punk guy a guy perfect for recording Babes in Toyland Mud Honey Tad a guy who focuses on recording rather than post production then they sign to the major label and they record Nevermind with Bruce V who's all about double tracks and elaborate overdubs and it's ridiculously successful but Cobain hates I mean, but it never mind. We gotta, I think we have to say that at time and Nevermind came out everybody killed that album we played it all the way through you knew every song it was you know it's a fantastic record but it was like eating 20 Cadbury cream eggs in a row after the 20th time Absolutely. you yeah. never want to see a Cadbury's cream egg again and, you know, and then like, again there's a reaction in Cobain in wanting to go back and get someone punky again like Steve Albini where the sound is all about the recording again when they recorded it Heart Shaped Box I think was the lead mm. single off of the Neutero he did get another engineer to overdub stuff they did put them like never, never mind Dish sort of touches on it and Steve Albini was really pissed off about that you know you want you know you hire me and well, Steve Albini has an ethic where he doesn't take a percentage like other producers just a flat fee because he believes that you shouldn't forever be taking money from the band's royalties but he does this on the precondition that the band pledged not to mess with the philosophy involved which is an emphasis of putting all the work into capturing the moment of recording you know he'll test a bunch of locations and then he'll pick up space with certain acoustics he'll set up numerous microphones and carefully calculated places and then once the music's in the can that's it he doesn't mess with it Kurt Cobain however is not happy he takes the tapes and begins elaborate overdubs so it was a sort of a vicious circle with him and it must have been frustrating that that impossible search to find the ideal balance when I look back now though and you look at that period of time I feel like that's who Kurt Cobain was he was somebody that was even though he wanted to grab this sort of punk ideal he was a, probably a perfectionist in many ways he was constantly searching for something probably the unattainable sound and you and I particularly you when you were at art college that is kind of the case sometimes whatever you do you're not satisfied with it and then, then when you finish something you're on to the next thing so the thing you've just delivered is the last thing you want to really think about so I think that a lot about musicians when they go into their studio they record their album they're probably sick of the songs by that stage then they've got to go and tour it for another year and a half and I reckon it creates this constant layer of artistic frustration and I think when you're dealing with producers and I imagine
imagine like the Steve Albini's, the Butch Biggs, and the Jack Endinos are people that probably seen a lot of crying artists in their time that they've had to go and calm down. It's okay, mate. It sounds okay. You know what I mean? Like it's all, yeah. it will be okay. Don't worry about it. But so I imagine that a lot of that went on with Cobain. I imagine the rest of the band kicking around in the background whilst Cobain was fussing over the tiniest of detail. But we wouldn't have all this music if it wasn't for the Cobains and the Lanigans and the Cornells being like that. You know, yeah, that's the yeah. way it is. Absolutely, absolutely. Of course, we saw them live. I remember them at the Astoria, a venue sadly no longer with us. There was also the Reading Festival. Again, festivals are not the best place to see a band. People are milling about throughout the day with varying levels of interest or knowledge about who's on stage. And there was that little crowd for Nirvana, wasn't there? But the following year, there were thousands of people going absolutely crazy for them. And we couldn't get anywhere near the stage. They were like little specks in the distance. It really was insane how quickly their popularity exponentially snowballed like that. Anyway, About a Girl, a wonderful track, is my number two. So, Business End, Jeremy, what have you chosen for us? So number one is Mud Honey Superfuzz Big Mud. Cover is that distillation we were talking about, Charles Peterson's photography, the movement in the photography. You know, you can imagine they're just playing live and it's just them. And another band that are still active, you know, they released an album last yeah. year, you know, so so they're still going. And Mark Arm, the lead singer, I think he, he manages distribution for Sub Pop, I say. He's very involved in the business. The track I've chosen is In and Out of Grace. And the main reason I've chosen that track, I think it is my favourite one on there, but I think it's because they were the first ones to use that sample from that Peter Fonda counterculture movie. From a 1966 Roger Corman biker movie called The Wild Angel. Uh, obviously famously um, Primal Scream used it for Loaded, you know, their yeah. sort of Andy Webber produced masterpiece. And whenever I did a mixtape, obviously I would include in that, I would use that exact same sample. So all the indie kids would be in the room going, oh great, it's Loaded. And then you'd get the gigantic free riff <laughs> explosion of In and Out of Grace and, and uh, Mark Arm bellowing Jesus, take me to a high. First you got that sort of circular drumming lined with guitar feedback then Mark Arm then straight in with the head banging riff tongue in cheek rock anarchy I mean they were great live weren't they first time I saw them live I thought it was the roadies coming on to check the instrument because you know those guys before and a bunch of blokes coming out checking everything's plugged they in one stop, well, all that they? <laughs> it was no and they, they so these th these dudes come on and you're kind of standing there like there was no fanfare no intro and it was them you know so they just pick yeah. up their, their guitars but they all turned into three Pete Townsend in front of one yeah, piece. That's a really they well were, you know, they were, um, they were brilliant. And I mean, I remember seeing them with Tad Nirvana in that sort of famous tour where they played together. And I thought Nirvana were okay. Tad were pretty good, but Mud Honey were, I thought, several bars above but in terms. That's what people would struggle to understand. I mean, Nirvana were great live, but we would have preferred to go and see Mud Honey. In particular, I think I think that Steve Turner, the guitarist, and Demarc Arm were great. They both would sort of do things on their guitar with the sort of effects and stuff like that, and they would be really good players you know and I think when you saw them live the great live bands are ones where you come home and you listen to their records but wish they were just the live performance you've just seen they were that good mm. their albums great as they are were you know seeing the mud honey is where to see them and I think it's just lucky now that we are of that generation we got to see those bands you yeah know? Like, you know yeah, we, saw, we saw mud honey in their absolute prime you know like yeah. they were firing on all cylinders they were brilliant it's the reassuring perennials of punk mud honey a number one for Jeremy with in and out of grace now John Peel famously described Teenage Kicks by The Undertones as the perfect single. Two and a half minutes of joy. The immediacy of it, the simple brilliance of it. I would say Touch Me I'm Sick by Mud Honey is absolutely everything I want in a single. Typically with Sub Pop, the B-side, Sweet Young Thing Ain't Sweet No More, is a classic in its own right. But Touch Me I'm Sick is an absolute joy. In your lifetime, you'll never buy another perfect seven inch single like that. Not unless the whole format makes an unexpected comeback. And the the cover is brilliant as well. The seven inch is like a toilet, isn't it? Like, yeah. It's got the sub pop branding, and then it's just got a picture of a toilet. It's iconic all round, not not just the song, but the but the single itself. And I remember going to countless nightclubs, and they would always play that, and yeah. the crowd would go wild. It's got such an energy to it straight off, and I think that was Mud Honey. I think when you play their tunes, they're just such a, a live power about it. It's got that anthemic quality as well. Throughout the song, people know or think they know the lyrics, not just the chorus. You know, it's got that driving riff, but it's got driving lyrics as well and I think Sonic Youth championed them and they, they covered Touch Me On Sick didn't they as well on a 12 inch where I think yeah. Mud Honey covered one of their songs and their version has got Kim Gordon on it which is great as well because it's such a great song to cover so there's been countless ones but I think nothing touches the original for punk uh, in your face attitude and they were not songs that your grandmother would like and that's no. the thing with Mud 
me. And the fact that they're American as well, I do remember we were talking earlier about the indie kids, you know, Manchester and, and the yeah. time, you know, and I'll be humbling my older self. I've gone back to a lot of that music and I now really like a lot of it that I didn't at the time. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Brief. We weren't really interested in Britpop. I, I quite like Pulp and Elastica and Salad, people like that, but it was more the American stuff we liked. Yeah, like, it's an interesting thing because a lot of the time in England, English people would champion English things. So, and so the yeah, American yeah, underground true. rock yeah. band at the time was not something that was popular and Nirvana were really down the track there were bands before that that set the path like yeah. Pixies Jane's Addiction and even before them you had like a Tusker Do and that's a great thing about punk and I'm sure Alan Anger mentioned this before punk blew up you had garage rock from America you know there was stuff yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. there's always somebody that argues what was the first punk band but I think in essence punk is always the thing that destroys what came before it so at the time when Sub Pop came out there was that sense that this is really great it's much more in your face than anything else at the moment and that's why I really loved it. So it's strange to be sitting here talking so many years later when at the time there wasn't the ability to grab your phone and check something on Spotify or YouTube to see if you like it or not. You had no choice. You heard it on the radio, then you went to the record shop and the excitement to get home and put that on your turntable and then put the needle down was the first time you really enjoyed some of the music. And that's a really good place to wrap this one up. It's been a long one, more of a tenor than a fiver. We both finished our selections placing Mud Honey at the pinnacle of Sub Pop's classic era. And as pre-digital old fellows inevitably opine how the younger generation are missing out on the delights of acquiring and playing vinyl. We think that's a pretty good selection. What do you think? What would you choose? Please tell us in the comments, smash a like and subscribe. Gorev Maragat, Jeremy. Love to okay. everyone. Take care, mate. See you. Yeah. Until next time, Jerome is Anandom. Slunk a foil. <laughs>